The first two questions in each section will be straight question and answer for each of the three candidates, with the next two questions providing an opportunity for open discussion at the conclusion of the Q&A. At the conclusion of the English section, we will provide two minutes to each of the candidates to cover off anything they'd like to add at the midway point of the debate. And once we have finished the four questions en français, we will provide an opportunity to each of the leadership candidates to make their closing pitch to members in the official language of their choice. The leadership candidates were informed of the themes in advance, but have not seen the specific questions in advance, except for the opening question. A draw by the leadership debate committee involving representatives of participating candidates took place last Thursday to determine the speaking order. I'd like to welcome our candidates participating in tonight's debate, Roman Baber, Baber, Scott Aitchison, and Jean Charest. Let's kick things off with our first question, which in many ways is your opening pitch for tonight. All of you have spent the last several months crisscrossing Canada, listening to and speaking with Canadians. What have you learned from Canadians? What's the mood of the country? And based on what you have heard from Canadians, what makes you the best candidate to be the next leader of our party? Again, each candidate will have three minutes to answer this question. We'll start with Scott Aitchison, three minutes. Great, thanks Rob, I appreciate it. Uh, the first thing I would say is that it's been an immense honor and a privilege to travel this country and meet Canadians from coast to coast. There's a lot more that unites us than the partisan bickering that goes on in Ottawa might suggest. But the single biggest thing that I hear Canadians tell me everywhere in this country is that they're actually looking for a government that simply des delivers results. They're tired of the photo ops, they're tired of this, the, the talk, but no real action on a wide range of issues. So how do we conservatives show that we're ready to lead? We have to show them a real plan, a real principled conservative plan. At my core, I'm a small town mayor and I've had to work hard all my career from municipal council up to mayor up to today to earn the trust of the people I serve. My campaign for the leadership of the Conservative Party has been about ideas, offering real solutions to the problems that Canadians face every day. And I believe we need to focus on three priorities. Making life more affordable, keeping Canada strong and free, and also defending Canadian values. You know, to make life more affordable, we must start by ending the housing crisis. And that's why I talk about implementing my YIMBY plan to get more homes built. We need to lower grocery bills. We need to end supply management. And in the process, we will also get government out of the way and help our farmers sell their products around the world. I'll also end the carbon tax. You know, only a liberal plan would take your money, hire a bureaucracy to manage it, mail some of it back to you, then ask you to thank them for it. You know, that's not fighting climate change. That's a shell game trying to cover up a tax scheme, another liberal tax and spend program. And speaking of taxes, they should be simple, predictable, fair, and lower. And so that's my plan to fix Canada's broken tax code to simplify it. And we need to keep Canada strong and free. We must once again be reliable partners on the world stage. That means investing in our armed forces and meeting our 2% NATO target. It means supporting countries like Taiwan and Israel who face threats to their democracy every single day. And at home, we need to stop attacking legal gun owners and instead focus on, the, on stopping the flow of illegal firearms heading into our country. You know, we have to be frank. To def to, to, to get this election done, to win the next election, to replace Justin Trudeau, we cannot do it unless we're united as a party. And so no matter what happens on September the 10th, we conservatives need to come together and offer Canadians a principled conservative message that will retire Justin Trudeau and get this country turned around. You can read more about it in my website at votescott.ca. I want to thank you for tuning in and sharing a few moments with you. I'm looking forward to answering more questions. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We'll now go to Jean Charest, three minutes. Thank you very much, Rob. And, and I want to start by saying that I'm delighted to be here. And I've accepted every invitation for debates or panels. And I actually thought when this leadership race started that the, this is fundamental to our responsibility towards the members of the party, to be accountable to them, to answer their questions, to participate in a, in a debate. For a candidate in a leadership race not to participate in the debate is like a fish who says he doesn't want to swim in the ocean. 
I mean, this is the basic thing that we all need to do and, and should be accountable for, and I, I, I want to commend both Roman and Scott for being here. And Scott, there's a lot of what you've just said that I, I agree with, and in particular about uniting the party. Because at the end of the day, if we are not united as a party, it's pretty simple. We're not going to be getting the confidence of Canadians. Rob, you talked about the mood of the country, and the mood of the country isn't very good. Our country is more divided today than it has been uh, since I've been involved in public life. And it isn't just east-west, it's intergenerational, it's between urban and rural Canadians, it's uh, also between new Canadians and uh, who, who now live in a period where they just feel that the federal government is not doing their job. In fact, I've never seen it so bad. The government of Mr. Trudeau can't run a passport office, the airports are a mess, the immigration department is a mess. I mean, there's nothing that's getting done. And yet we pay taxes for all of this and you'd think that they would have their act together. And there's an urgency to change governments. Canadians want change. And they're looking to us as conservatives as the alternative. And that's what this race is about, to offer an alternative. I've done exactly that with policies on defense, policies on environment and, and resources, policies on daycare, policies that speak to the fundamental issues that our families are facing in this country, affordability, housing, all these things that count for every one of us. But conservatives, if there's one thing I want to say to conservatives that I've heard from every one of you is that you have had enough of losing. We lost in 15, 19, 21. And it isn't so much that we lose, that we lose the campaign, well, the, that the Liberals win. We give it away to them. We have to be the most generous party in the world. Well, if we've had enough of losing, if there's one thing that is now clear in the race at the moment that I am speaking to you now, is that I can win a majority government. And that's what we need. None of the good ideas that Scott has, Roman has, that I will propose in this leadership race, will actually mean anything unless we gain the confidence of Canadians in urban areas, in Ontario, in Quebec, in Alberta, and that we work out of the base that we have in Western Canada. In this race, there is one choice. If we want to form government, I ask you to support my leadership. Thank That's you. what this candidate campaign is all about. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Charest. Uh, we don't have any sad trombones in this debate, so I'll ask uh, all of you to indulge me as I keep the uh, order going. Although I did uh, do some trombone in junior high, but no, no sad trombones here. And we'll turn the floor now over to uh, Mr. Babber. You have three minutes. Thank you, Rob. Rob, I'm a friendly guy, and over the last few months, I've spoken to thousands of Canadians. Canadians tell me that they're tired of the incompetence of this liberal government. I practiced law for 12 years before I was elected and I helped build a small business. So I'm going to bring my private sector skills to create a culture of professionalism and accountability in the federal government. Many Canadians tell me that they're giving up on Canada and then they want to go on their own. I'll extend a hand of friendship to every Canadian in every province to heal our divisions. It doesn't matter who you are or where you live, you'll have a friend and someone who will listen to you in the federal government. And I promise you, many Canadians are telling me that they're not feeling well. That's probably the most important issue that's facing us today. A mental health catastrophe is gripping our nation. Most of us have COVID and 85% of us are vaccinated. We need to end, and I will end this public health exercise. And going forward, let Canadians make their own choices together with their doctors. We need relief and we need to move on so we can all heal. I hear from many Canadians how hurt they are by 21st century segregation, how personal choice and basic security of a person were violated. Many Canadians lost their jobs, denied mobility, access to loved ones in a hospital. I was the only conservative fighting this evil before it was cool. I brought a bill in Ontario to stand up for jobs a year ago. I will ban this discrimination and freeze funding to any province that still allows it. People are people. I learned that in law school when I worked at a community legal aid clinic you have to respect people's choices and people's dignity. Canadians are scared of censorship and government. We're censored in the media, online, by regulators, at work. I lived the first nine years of my life under a communist regime. My family feared the KGB and taught me not to talk about politics or disclose that we had a prayer book. I got the gift of freedom and I know how precious and fragile our democracy is. We're free, we're free Canadian, and we have the right to be wrong. Speech is the holy grail of all rights, because through speech, 
we defend all other rights. I'll repeal all of the censorship bills. I'll defend professionals. There is no free speech without free and independent media. I'll free social media, defend the CBC, and end all subsidies and bailouts to the media. I will never silence Canadians, political opponents, or members of parliament. Finally, Canadians are losing trust in government, but not with me. I got kicked out of the Conservative caucus in Ontario for opposing the lockdowns. I lost my justice committee chair, and my loved ones have been put through very hard times. But I fought like hell, every way I knew how, because that's what Canadians expect from us, for our democracy and for our children. I'm always going to say what I believe and do what I believe is right, even when it's unpopular. And that's a principle I'll return to the Conservative Party. Canadians are counting on us. I'd be very humbled to lead our party and our country. Thank you, Mr. Babber. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll turn now to our next question. Each of you will get 90 seconds to respond. Last week, Pope Francis visited Alberta, Quebec, and Nunavut to apologize to Indigenous people for the horrors of residential schools. As our next Conservative Prime Minister, how will you succeed in restoring trust, respect, and economic opportunity with Indigenous peoples? We'll start with Jean Charest. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. This is one of the sad legacies of Mr. Trudeau. He created an incredible expectations about reconciliation. But let's just dwell a moment on one example. He said he would fix the problem of portable, potable drinking water in First Nations Indigenous communities. And it isn't done. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, after all seven years, you think this can't be done? I guarantee you one thing, I'm Prime Minister of this country, it will be done. We will do what we have to do to fix this. It is inadmissible that Canada would accept this. And for indigenous, indigenous Canadians, what we need is to help them develop their leadership and their economic base for their communities. One of the things I want to do is a federal Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. I'm stealing a book out of what Alberta did, so that we offer Indigenous leaders and communities the opportunity to participate in their economic development, not just by receiving royalties or passing on their land, but actually owning equity in projects. That is the kind of change that will be consequential and real for Indigenous Canadians. Same thing for housing. In this leadership race, housing is a big issue, Scott's just raised it. I think Indigenous Canadians should have a program run by them for Indigenous Canadians. That's the kind of real-time leadership that the country needs. Thank you, Mr. Shara. We'll move now to Roman Babber. One minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. I think we have to be honest and learn from our history so we don't repeat it. But dividing Canadians like Justin Trudeau does actually hurts reconciliation. The best thing we can do for reconciliation is to improve the lives of Indigenous peoples. We still have hundreds of communities in Canada that don't have clean water, and we've been talking about this for 20 years. We can make water out of air now. There are no more excuses. I'm going to get water done by the end of my first term. But there's no improving lives without safety and dignity. Many reserves are experiencing lawlessness and violence. We must protect Indigenous people and especially Indigenous women. We must stop pretending that this isn't happening. We must defend all Canadians, and that means instructing law enforcement to defend Canadians who live on reserves. And generally, let's stop being afraid and start rethinking life on the reserve. Imagine not owning your own property. Imagine being told by a chief that you no longer live in your home and that someone else is now going to occupy your home. I'm not going to pay lip service and I'm not going to play pretend. I'm going to work with a new generation of Indigenous leaders and Indigenous business leaders to improve the lives and safety of Indigenous Canadians. Home ownership improves communities and the quality of life. Let's get it done. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll now go to Scott Aitchison. Thanks. One minute, 30 seconds. Thanks, Rob. I, I, I would say that this has really been the most important theme of my campaign, is one of respect. And this, I would say, is where our institutions have most failed um, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. And you think about the question, relationship. It hasn't been a relationship for generations in this country. It's been a top-down, patriarchal kind of approach. Uh, and in some cases, early on, it was about you know, erasing Indigenous First Nations culture. 
And so I, I look at what's has, what has gone on, and, and Jean spoke a little bit about this. You know, in the last six years, the Liberals have completed 12 of the 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. 12. In 2020, they completed a grand total of zero. And in 2021, when hundreds of unmarked graves were discovered at residential schools, the Liberals completed three within the span of a, a month. So why did it take such a horrible discovery for the Liberals to take action? It's because they don't take action. They're about photo ops and talk and not action. And so as Conservative leader and as Prime Minister, I would start from a position of a real relationship, which is about respect. We know what First Nations people want and what they frankly deserve from what we learned in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. We need to make sure that that relationship is real and we improve the lives of First Nations people everywhere. And as Conservative Party leader, I will get it done. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Thank you, candidates. For the next two questions, as a reminder, after our Q&A round for each question, we'll have a four-minute open discussion period. As moderator, I reserve the right to intervene as appropriate during the four minutes to ensure each candidate is given comparable time to speak. Now on to our question. It's harder than ever to travel across Canada. Inner city bus service has disappeared in many parts of the country. Passenger rail is so inadequate that Canada's environment minister was forced to abandon his cross Canada climate change rail tour. Pearson Airport's a mess and our major air carriers have reduced service in the peak summer season. As the next Prime Minister, how will you get Canadians moving again? And we'll start with Roman Baber, sir. You have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. There's a very important issue regarding mobility of Canadians that I'd like to address first. It's unthinkable that we still force 15% of Canadians to detain themselves under threat of jail every time they enter and exit Canada. Mobility rights are not just charter rights. They're human rights. The passports do not prevent the spread of COVID, and we need to end the shameful episode in our nation's history. And no new normal in mobility. Public Safety Minister Michael, uh, Marco Mendocino said that the federal government now sees a use for the ArriveCan app beyond the pandemic. This is exactly what many of us have feared. The tools that were created, that were developed to keep Canadians safe from COVID, will remain post the pandemic and will form a new surveillance state. I will not allow Canada to turn into a surveillance state. A free and democratic society does not hinder entry and exit of its citizens. Next, I'm in favor of massive transit in the GTA. I represented a North Toronto riding and we should not be afraid to talk about issues that are important to folks in the GTA. It's good for the economy, it's good on our balance sheet, it's easy to finance and will spur economic growth and it's good for housing. And the best thing we can do for housing is build more roads. Building roads encourages the construction of new and affordable communities. I'm going to start building roads again in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Bauer. We'll move now to Scott Aitchison. One minute, 30 seconds. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Rob. Well, I, th there's no question that we've all heard the horror stories at, you know, Pearson Airport where things are a disaster, where our airlines... Uh, whether it's, you know, passport lines that people can't get a passport in this country because, again, the Liberals just can't get the job done. Whether it's Nexus lines where, you know, Canadians, you know, pay huge fees for air travel and rail travel and it's not really a great service to begin with. But I, I, I think what matters even more than this issue, frankly, and, uh, and I, I, like, I really think it's the most important issue that Canadians face today, is, is social mobility and upward social mobility. And I'm pivoting back to to the importance of housing. Because there are an awful lot of Canadians in this country who can't even dream of the idea of taking a flight somewhere because they don't have a warm bed to sleep in at night. And to me, that's the, that's the, that is the great crime that this government, this Liberal government, has promised billions and billions of dollars over the last seven years, and the situation has gotten worse. The, C the CMHC has told us the situation is actually worse. And so I've said many times, if promising billions of dollars could solve the problem, we'd have a housing surplus in this country, and we don't. And so while it's important to clean up the mess and actually get services working for Canadians so they can travel again and we can move around this country, the most important issue facing us, frankly, is making sure that every Canadian has a warm, safe bed to sleep in at night. And I will get that done. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Jean Charest, you now have one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. You know, transport is one of the key drivers of our economy. 
And, and it is about the simple idea of moving from one place to the other, but it's about productivity, it's about an economy that works, it's about the ability of Canadians to actually get to their place of work and get back home and do it efficiently. We live in a federal system of government. There is a role, and if, we, if we're going to get this job done, it requires that we have a Prime Minister who under, actually understands how this country of ours works. The provinces have their responsibilities and the municipalities have their responsibilities. As Prime Minister, one of the first things I would do is within the six months after being elected is convene a federal provincial meeting with the Premiers, the Council of the Federation. This would be one of the items on the agenda. How do we actually sit down together, because we can't do it otherwise, to make sure that we have the kind of infrastructure we need to be able to move people around, whether it's buses or trains or it's ports or airports. On airports, yeah, it's sad. It's, all of us are traveling these days. I mean, it has become uh, you know, a, a nightmare. Who would have thought Mr. Trudeau wanted us to be one of the best countries in the world, that we'd rank among the best? Well, we actually rank among the highest in the world for the worst airports. Pearson Airport. And airports, Rob, is the entry point of any given country. Who would have thought we'd be a country that you can visit for a week and leave your butt luggage here for two weeks? I don't, I don't think that's exactly what we want. Thank and I, I can guarantee you, I'll do better. Thank you, Mr. Shadai. We'll move now to our four minutes of open discussion. And I'll invite Robin Babber to get us started. Mr. Babber. Thank you. Look, if we learned anything from the Rogers outage a couple of weeks ago is the terrible state of our federally regulated industries. We have a complete mess because we have three phone companies, two airlines, and five banks. There's absolutely no reason to continue to defend this antiquated regime or any of those antiquated institutions. No, we need more competition to get, their, uh, to get them off their backs and working again. So I propose that we allow for more competition, and that includes competition in airlines. British Airways lands in Toronto on its way to Vancouver. There's no reason why I can't hop on it and, and pay less. So I propose to remove barriers to entry and encourage competition. Attract new players. No more protectionism. It'll be good for the economy. It'll be good for jobs. It'll be good for the consumer and good for prices. I'm going to free these federally regulated industries and get Canadians moving again. Mr. Atchison, your thoughts? Yeah, I, and I would completely agree with what Roman has said. We do need more competition. Uh, it's amazing to me in this country how much we have traded away for exceptional service or some sort of nationalism around you know, our own airlines and, and that kind of thing. But you know, uh, the bigger issue for me for the airlines and for the airports, frankly, uh, is, that, is that in a lot of other countries, they see airports as economic development tools and drivers. Here in Canada, we see them as cash cows. So the Ministry of Transportation just charges them huge rents. Uh, and, and, and that's crippling to airports. And, and we should see them as, as massive economic development drivers not just for tourism, but, 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 but for trade around the world. We're a trading nation, and, and these are the, the, the major ports that we get goods in and out of this country. And so we, sh we should see them as economic development tools, not as cash cows. And, and frankly, we need to create a culture of accountability in these government agencies. That's the problem in Ottawa in general, is that there's, there's not a culture of accountability and results. And that's what a Conservative government led by me would deliver. Mr. Shutter. Something's terribly wrong in this country, uh, Rob. It's passports, airports, uh, the Department of Immigration. The government's not working. It's not delivering services. By the way, when you go to the airport and you buy a ticket and to travel somewhere, you actually pay fees. You, as a citizen, you pay for the services that you're supposed to get at the airport. This isn't, it doesn't happen for free. And you're not getting those services. So the, this, the next federal government has to get serious about and give real direction to how airports should be administered with accountability, with benchmarks on service that you receive. For example, on ArriveCan, ArriveCan we should do away with the first day that we form the government. There's enough bureaucracy at the airport. We don't need to layer it on. So these are things that we should do. I'm also a big believer, Rob, in, in, the, uh, in, in using the train service. I think one of the lost opportunities in this country for years has been our, an opportunity for us to develop a rail service across the country that's much more efficient, of faster trains. We could actually connect to the United States, do things with them that would allow us to change the cities of Canada, change the way that we travel. But for that to happen, we need a, a federal government that has a vision and gets serious about this. Okay, Mr. Shadar, we got 40 seconds. Uh, Mr. Babber, Mr. Atchison, uh, 
Either you want to dive in? I think a lot of this, I think a lot of what's happening right now at the airports, at the passport office, is a self-inflicted wound. We know that this government is so determined, it's so intent to pursue a misguided COVID ideological response that is no longer based in science. It creates friction at our airports, at our passport offices, in our healthcare, and, everything, and everywhere else. We need to end and go back to normal. It will immediately give us relief. Let's give Mr. Aitchison a few seconds there. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a classic situation. We have a liberal government that believes that the government should be and all, do and be all things to all people. It's simply not the case. Conservatives know that if you introduce competition, you can actually improve services. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Great discussion, candidates. We'll move now to our next question. Conservative Party members oppose a carbon tax, but Conservatives are also committed to action on climate change. Both statements are included in the party's policy declaration, and groups like Conservatives for Clean Growth are calling for a stable, credible, long-term net zero climate plan. My question is, can we have a net zero climate plan while maintaining the party's opposition to a carbon tax? Scott Aitchison, the floor is yours for the next one minute 30 seconds. And the simple answer to that question, Rob, is yes, we can. You know, for seven years, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals have missed every single climate target they've set. And what's worse, they've just sought to divide Canadians by attacking our energy sector. We are a resource superpower, this country. And all they've done is attack our resources. Conservatives will do better. We can do better. My, my plan to fight climate change and protect the environment will actually get the job done. If I become Conservative leader and Prime Minister, here's what we'll do. We will have an infrastructure resilience plan to help Canadians deal and adapt with the extreme weather events. Climate change is here, and we need to invest before disaster strikes, not after. We will lower industrial emissions by making the biggest polluters pay. We will phase out coal and intensify, densify our cities and invest in technology, not taxes. We will focus on nuclear power, Carbon, carp carbon, carp carbon capture technology will get the job done. Canadians need to see this as an opportunity. If Canada was wiped away from the face of the earth tomorrow, it would have a negligible ch impact on climate change and, and the carbon output on the planet. So we need to do our bit, but also make sure that we are selling this innovative and entrepreneurial technology to the world to help the rest of the world reduce their footprint as well. We have the tools. We have the skill set. We have the know-how. Let's Let's sell it to the world. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We'll turn now to Jean Charest, one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Rob. One of the keys to us forming a national government is having a credible plan on the environment, resources, and climate. If we don't have that, we will not be elected, period. And uh, by the way, a slogan is not a climate plan. And you can't tax your way in to reducing carbon emissions. That is not a plan either. I would do away with Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax on consumers because it hurts rural Canadians, it hurts small and medium-sized businesses. What I would do is a comprehensive approach and it includes carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, whether blue or green, biofuels, small modular reactors. These are all the areas in which Canada can develop expertise. There's four provinces working together on small modular reactors that includes Saskatchewan, Alberta, Ontario, and New Brunswick. We can lead the world in this, and if we do it, we'd actually assist the oil patch by allowing them to have a different source of energy than natural gas to be able to draw the bitumen and the oil that we should sell around the world as a reliable and ethical supplier. The world in Ukraine has reminded us that had we assumed our responsibilities, had we been wiser and had a prime minister who had some leadership, that we would actually be able to go out there and supply energy to Europe instead of watching Europeans finance Russia to invade Ukraine. We can do this and have a levy on big Thank you, Mr. producers. That's the Thank approach you, Mr. that Canada needs. You'll have some time during the open discussion. Uh, we'll move now to Roman Babber, one minute, 30 seconds. I'm going to take a different approach, Rob. Uh, I was not afraid to take on, on the radical COVID mob, and I will not be afraid to take on the radical left-wing environmental mob. We should not, as Conservatives, be afraid uh, about talking about the environment. We know that Canada produces less than 1.5% of all global emissions, and there is no certainty that even if you were to cut all of those emissions, that that would make a material difference in the climate. We know who the polluters are. They're in China. They're in Russia. They're in India. And the Paris Accord does not hold them anywhere near 
to the same standard as Canada is held to. So I'm going to reframe this conversation. Canada is blessed with so much forest that much of our greenhouse gases are actually naturally absorbed. And we don't get credit for that under the Paris Accord. And I do not believe that taxing Sally $10 at the gas pump every time she fills up her car is actually going to affect the global climate. I don't think that many people actually believe that anymore. And I think that many Canadians agree with me on this topic. So I will not impose a regressive tax that only serves to punish Canadians. However, I would like to look at planting more trees. Right now, we're planting about 360 million trees a year. I would look to increase that to half a billion a year. I love trees. I love Canadian forest. Let's try to capture most of our emissions naturally. Thank you, Mr. Barber. We'll open up our four minutes of uh, discussion and ask uh, Scott Aitchison to get us started. Mr. Thanks, Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. And I, uh, I, I guess I'd like to challenge my, uh, my colleagues a little bit here. We're very friendly. We all get along. But I think it's important to, to challenge. And I, and I appreciate where Roman comes from on this issue and what, what, what you said, Roman. But at the same time, you know, my comments about you know, marketing technologies to the rest of the world to help them reduce their footprint is important as well. And I, and I think it's important that, you know, why don't you acknowledge that, that we can see this as an opportunity for businesses and entrepreneurs in Canada. And I want to challenge Jean as well, because Jean, you talked about the importance of having a climate change plan and a policy that we, if we don't have that, we will not actually be elected as the next government. But unity is also really important as well within our party. And so I, I want to challenge you, Jean, because there's been a lot of talk about what happens after this. If, if I don't win or you don't win or you don't win, what happens? We have to come together as a party after this is over, whoever the leader is, and work together. Will you be part of that? Will you continue to work together as a conservative with the team, whoever the leader is, and help bring the party together? But Scott, would, do you disagree with me that this is a key issue for us being elected? Absolutely it is. It is? Okay. Well, then we agree on that. We agree. We need a credible plan. And by the way, conservatives should, uh, you know, take some credit for our history in dealing with these issues. Rob, we actually gave birth to the most credible, the most effective uh, environmental treaty in the world, the Montreal Protocol on reducing CFCs and HCFCs, which, by the way, contains economic instruments. We're the government that actually did the Clean Air Act of the United States to reduce SO2 emissions. That also includes uh, e economic mechanisms. So my proposal is taking a book out of the page of what Alberta does with a levy on large emitters, which are the most effective ones to be able to deal with this. And by the way, this is what the oil patch agrees with, so that we are able to reach zero emissions by 2050 and do it in a smart way. And we should you know, look at what Europe's doing. After Glasgow, Europe has actually proposed a transitional period that includes natural gas and nuclear. Well, Canada needs to be smart about this, and we can be smart about it. And if you know, if you follow what's being done in Alberta, the positions taken in the energy industry, they actually agree with this approach. This is the smart approach that will get the job done, and you know what? We'll also gain the support of Canadians and elect a national conservative government. Thank you, Mr. Shaddai. Mr. Baber. Thank you, Rob. Look, Scott, of course I'm in favor of, of new and, and advanced technologies. I just want to make sure that the taxpayer is not held holding the bag. We've seen that happening in Ontario with the former Kathleen Wynne and previously the McGuinty government that would finance all sorts of green technologies. Uh, for instance, there were a lot of solar panels that were costing us about 70 cents a kilowatt of, of hydro, uh, but the market rate was about 7 cents. And so Ontarians were held uh, holding the difference and, and paying the difference, and that's what created this, this remarkable uh, green energy debt that Ontarians are now settled with. Second of all, what I'm against is imposing on Canadians a way of life that they do not want to live. And I do not believe that Canadians should be made to, to drive less or to farm less, especially farm less. We have a global insecurity in food. We have a global food shortage. And, and you know, there's a lot of joking going around with a plant outside of London, Ontario, and, and four million crickets, and, and I'm not eating crickets. I think that we should be able to farm not less, we should farm more. And we should also, in order for us to get out of the economic mess that we're in, 
we need to turn Canada into natural resources superpower that we ought to be instead of hindering our manufacturing of natural resources. <laughs> well, do I look like a guy Ten who eats crickets? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say I would do away with the Trudeau uh, carbon tax on consumers and also repeal B, C48 and C69. These Thank two very important uh, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shara. And I don't think there are any crickets at home, whether eating or people watching. Very good discussion uh, amongst our three candidates. To wrap up our English language section of the debate, I'm now going to ask each of the three participating candidates to share any additional comments they wish members to hear before we move to the French language section of the debate. Each of you will get two minutes and we'll begin with Scott Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. You know, our answer to Justin Trudeau's divisive politics cannot be more division. We must lead with respect. We have to offer real solutions to the challenges Canadians face every day and, and produce a government that actually delivers results. We can't be the party that just rails against government. We have to be the party that offers better government, that actually respects taxpayer dollars and delivers results. We also have to come together as conservatives. I would point out in the last little discussion there that Roman answered my question, but Jean did not, about what happens after this leadership race. We have to come together. Whoever the leader of the party is on September the 11th, Every one of us must come together. And I challenge every candidate in this race to stand up and say that they will come together. They will work with the conservative movement, whoever the leader is, work with our team in Ottawa to make sure that we are united, that we are presenting a conservative, principled, conservative, consistent message, and that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. We simply cannot do it unless we are united. Canadians are frustrated. They are looking for an alternative. They don't, Justin Trudeau didn't win the last election. We lost it. We have to do better. Canadians deserve better government. Canadians deserve better from us. And so I encourage you, look at my plan. I talk about real solutions that actually present solutions to the problems that Canadians face every single day. Not just taglines, not just talk, not just Justin Trudeau style photo ops, but real solutions. Check out votescott.ca. You can read all about it there, and no matter what happens on September the 10th, I commit that as Conservatives, I will work as a member of the team, as a member of Parliament, I will work with our team to bring our caucus together, to bring our movement together, and to make sure that we defeat Justin Trudeau in the next election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. Roman Baber, you now have two minutes. Thank you, Rob. Um, my dear Canadians, I'm optimistic because the media is turning on Justin Trudeau. And many of his ministers are now on the ropes and Canadians are tired of this unscientific COVID response and the divisive tone that the Prime Minister insists on. I personally cannot wait for the next general election. I never wanted to win an election this badly because frankly, our country is at stake. And I hear all this talk uh, about division in our party and, and people that are not on the leadership ballot talking about alternatives, it saddens me immensely. So. I want you to imagine a scenario. It's the day after the election and you wake up and Justin Trudeau is re-elected Prime Minister. Or even worse, Christia Freeland is Prime Minister now. Not good, right? Well, we're counting on each other to make sure that this does not happen. And that means that we must stick together for the sake of our nation. We all need to take a step back, take a deep breath, simmer down. Our party is almost 700,000 members strong. It's a credit to every leadership contestant in this race. On September 10th, I will stretch out all five, eight and a half inches of me to embrace and unite this party, regardless of who wins. And I'm counting on each one of my friends to come along and do the same. And I also wanna ask you to rank me first. There's no vote splitting, as long as you mark another candidate second. If I don't win, then once I fall off the ballot, your vote will go to your second choice. You will still get the result that you like. But no, it doesn't work the other way around. If you mark me second, I may not get your vote if your first cho unless your first choice finishes last. So please mark me first to reject the COVID policies of the last two years. Please mark me first to send a message to the Conservative Party that it must stand on principle even when it's difficult. And mark me first to have a strong democratic movement Thank you, Mr. within Bauer. our party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baber. Jean Charest, you now have two minutes. Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison, and I all agree on one thing. 
if we are going to unite the party, you have to show up. You actually have to show up. You have to speak to the membership. You can't treat them with contempt. At this point in the leadership race, about close, what, maybe 25% of members have voted, 75% of you have not yet cast your ballot. This is the moment where you are the one who should be holding us accountable on what it is that we're proposing in terms of leadership. I've led caucuses, federally. I've done it in a province, and I've done it successfully. I have a track record of uniting. And this party, if there's one thing this party has to sort out, more than anything else, because we paid a high price for it in 19 and 21, a very high price, and now the country's paying a high price for it, is getting our country, our party organized and united. I will do that. I know how to do it. It's what I've done all my life. And if we are able to do that, well then that's the first condition to uniting the, part, the country. This country is crying out for our leadership. There is a boulevard out there of Canadians who want a fiscally conservative government who's going to have a real economic plan for the country and also understands that we can't get big projects done. We can't get pipelines done. We can't get energy projects done unless there's a national government. And it would be a breath of fresh air, ladies and gentlemen, to actually have a prime minister in Canada who lives outside of the Ottawa bubble, whether it's the media or it's the political parties or the bureaucracy, and actually understands how this country works, respects the provinces, respects his own party members, and is able to make this country work to the benefit of all Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Sharad. This brings to a close the English language section of the debate. Although candidates will be free to give their closing statements in the official language of their choice after the French language section of the debate. Uh, mesdames et messieurs, après cette courte pause de 30 secondes, nous allons débuter le débat en français. Merci. Deuxième partie du débat qui se déroulera en français. Pour ceux qui viennent de se joindre à nous, mon nom est Rob Batherson, président de l'exécutif national du Parti conservateur du Canada et votre modérateur pour ce soir. Pour le troisième débat officiel de la chefferie du Parti conservateur, nous avons avec nous ce soir les candidats Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison et Jean Charest. Le format est presque identique à la section en anglais à l'exception de la dernière déclaration des candidats où nous permettrons que les candidats s'expriment dans la langue de leur choix. Et maintenant, messieurs, êtes-vous prêts pour la première question? OK. Les conservateurs ont assez de perdre. Lors des trois dernières élections générales avec trois chefs différents, Stephen Harper, Andrew Scheer et Aaron O'Toole, nous avons perdu face à Justin Trudeau. Pourtant, lors des deux dernières élections, notre parti a remporté le vote populaire. Quelles sont les choses les plus importantes que vous puissiez faire en tant que chef conservateur au cours des 100 premières, premiers jours pour mettre notre parti sur la voie de la victoire? On va commencer avec M. Jean Charest, 1 minute 30 secondes. Merci beaucoup, Rob, et, et je veux également saluer la présence de, de Roman Baber ce soir et de Scott Aitchison qui comme moi, croit beaucoup à la démocratie et à l'importance, par respect en vous les, envers vous, les membres, de, de se défendre dans un débat public, de présenter nos idées, nos politiques. Et d'ailleurs, cela, c'est l'essentiel de ce que nous aurons à faire le lendemain de cette course au leadership. Et lorsque je serai chef, le premier défi du chef, c'est d'unir le parti. Ça va de soi. En 19, en, en 21, nous étions en ordre dispersé. Et les Canadiens n'ont pas élu les libéraux fédéraux. Au contraire, et c'est les conservateurs qui ont perdu l'élection générale, on l'a presque donné. Alors qu'il y a des millions de Canadiens qui veulent un gouvernement qui est conservateur sur le plan fiscal, qui a un plan économique qui est très clair, capable d'unir le pays, capable de réaliser des grands projets. Alors, dans les 100 premiers jours pour le nouveau chef, évidemment, l'unité du parti, c'est le premier sujet. L'unité du caucus, les militants, les militantes, préparer le programme pour la campagne électorale aussi. C'est un gouvernement minoritaire. On peut se retrouver en élection très rapidement, très rapidement. Je le sais, moi j'en ai fait des élections générales, j'en ai fait au fédéral, j'en ai fait au Québec avec succès et j'ai gagné des élections, mais ça se prépare longtemps à l'avance. Encore faut-il avoir un chef qui est prêt dès le premier jour à faire face à la musique. 
et je suis la personne capable d'unir le parti et d'unir le parti pour unir le pays. Merci, M. Charret. On va passer à M. Roman Baber, une minute trente secondes. Merci. Comme premier ministre, d'abord, je réunirai une équipe euh, de personnes compétentes pour apporter une culture de professionnalisme au gouvernement. Je tendrai une main amicale à chaque Canadien pour essayer de combler nos divisions régionales. Ensuite, nous devons reprendre une vie normale. Les Canadiens sont invités à faire leur propre choix médical et consultation avec leur propre médecin. Ensuite, le vaccin n'empêche pas la transmission et doit être un choix individuel. Je vais introduire tous les passeports et mandats à travers les pays. Prochaine, la censure est la plus grande menace sur notre démocratie. J'aborderai tous les lois libérales sur la censure. Je supprimerai le financement de Radio-Canada et je mettrai fin à tous les soutiens aux médias. J'abrogerai le taxe sur le carbone et le projet de loi anti oléoduc comme les deux premières étapes pour transformer notre pays en une super, super puissance de ressources naturelles. Enfin, je, fer, je ferai ouvrir une uh, enquête judiciaire sur la question de la pandémie. Les Canadiens méritent que nous tenions un compétent le gouvernement de Justin Trudeau responsable. Je travaillais sans relâche pour chaque Canadien. Merci. Merci, M. Barber. Et la prochaine réponse sera de M. Scott Aitchison. Une minute, trente secondes. Euh, merci. Mes priorités pour les 100 premiers jours sont presque les mêmes que vous, monsieur. Nous devons nous rappeler que Justin Trudeau peut déclencher une élection rapidement. Euh, Peut-être parce qu'il a peur à moi, euh, mais nous devons être prêts. Un, il faut unifier le parti et le caucus. Nous n'avons pas le choix. Deux, il faut nommer une équipe de campagne et prendre les meilleurs organisateurs de chacun de nos campagnes. Ces gens ont fait la preuve. Trois, nommer un comité de plateforme et incluant le caucus et le parti. Mes priorités pour les 100 premiers jeux de gouvernement conservateur, inviter les premiers ministres pour élaborer le process pour améliorer le système de santé canadien. Adopter les mesures pour mettre fin à la gestion de l'offre, tout en s'assurant que les Américains nous donnent, donnent quelque chose en retour. Par exemple, une assurance bois sera une bonne chose. Rendre public notre plan pour l'élimination du déficit et redonner confiance aux investisseurs et aux Canadiens. Finalement, faire nous sortir que l'on mette, mette en place les mesures pour que mon plan, oui, dans ma cour. Merci. Merci, M. Aitchison. Merci, Monsieur. Notre prochaine question. Les Canadiennes et Canadiens qui habitent dans nos collectivités rurales se sentent souvent exclus des décisions du gouvernement. Nous le voyons partout que ce soit le manque de services Internet à haute vitesse ou bien le manque d'écoute du gouvernement Trudeau envers nos agriculteurs qui ont besoin de l'engrais pour nous nourrir. En tant que premier ministre, comment veillerez-vous à ce que les priorités rurales reçoivent l'attention qu'elles méritent au sein de votre gouvernement? Et pour cette question, on va commencer avec M. Roman Baber. Merci. Une minute trente secondes. Merci. La meilleure chose que nous puissions faire Uh, pour encourager les opportunités pour le Canada rural et de laisser un travail. Uh, les deux secteurs où le gouvernement empêche, em, empêche le Canadien le plus de travail sont l'agriculture et les ressources naturelles. Il y a un manque uh, alimentaire mondial, mais Justin Trudeau veut réduire l'agriculture. Nous devons faire le contraire. Nous devons encourager davantage l'agriculture pour l'exportation et nourrir les Canadiens. Je crois aussi que euh, nos ressources naturelles sont une bénédiction et je ne les ai pas le pétrole et le gaz être annulés. Mais je suis aussi intéressé par l'exploitation minière. Euh, le monde a soif des métaux précieux. Euh, je vais donc libérer notre industrie minière et nous pouvons encore être euh, responsables. 
Et sera formidable pour nos collectifs du Nord et le euh, peuple à Tacon. Et c'est aussi la seule façon de faire construire des routes et des infrastructures dans la région et le nid. Euh, cela ouvrira des opportunités et améliorera l'habitabilité. Merci. Merci, M. Barber. Et maintenant, M. Scott Aitchison, une minute, 30 secondes. Merci, Rob. Je suis moi-même un, un député qui représente une région, une région rurale. Donc, je connais bien la réalité du Canada rural. Le Canada rural est, a été oublié par les libéraux de Justin Trudeau. Ils ont promis des milliards, milliards de dollars pour l'Internet à, à haute vitesse en région éloignée et pourtant, cette infrastructure moderne continue d'être l'une lenteur embarrassante et n'est pas disponible pour un, gros, un grand, trop grand nombre des Canadiens. Les régions rurales ont besoin de l'Internet au même titre que les gens de, des villes. Les crises du logement est aussi réelle dans les petites communautés rurales que dans les villes. Et malgré les milliards de dollars promis par les libéraux de Justin Trudeau, la crise, c'est grave dans les Canada rural. Les factures d'épicerie sont hors de contrôle et la gestion de l'offre fait grimper le coût des aliments. La fin de la gestion de l'offre aiderait à rétablir la ferme familiale dans les régions rurales. En tant que premier ministre, je vais obtenir le réussi à logement terminé. Assurez-vous que mon plan de logement inclut des petites villes et le Canada, supprimer les taxes sur le carbone imposées par Justin Trudeau aux consommateurs, j'aiderai les Canadiens à réduire leur empreinte et fin. Merci, M. Hutchison. Merci. On va passer la parole maintenant à M. Jean Charest. Une minute, trente secondes. Merci. Alors, c'est un des grands enjeux pour l'économie canadienne. On a, nous avons besoin des régions rurales pour prospérer. Perdons jamais de vue, par exemple, que le secteur minier qui est concentré dans les régions du Québec alimente les emplois, que ce soit le Québec ou le Canada, alimente des milliers d'emplois à Montréal ou à Toronto ou à Calgary. Et c'est le propre de notre économie de comprendre le lien entre les deux, d'où l'impératif et l'importance de soutenir les régions rurales. J'ai toujours été en, en soutien au secteur des ressources naturelles. Le plan Nord que j'avais proposé en est un exemple qui est très éloquent, mais ce n'est pas uniquement ça. C'est aussi l'Internet haute vitesse. C'est aussi les services de santé. Il y avait un reportage l'autre jour sur Fogo Island, qui est à Terre-Neuve-Labrador, où il se trouve un hôtel qui est vraiment de classe mondiale, qui n'a pas de médecin qui faisait penser au, au, au film qui a été un succès mondial, qui s'appelait « La grande séduction », sur la disponibilité des médecins. Ben moi, quand j'étais justement au gouvernement, j'ai fait un truc qui a marché de manière merveilleuse. La faculté de droit de l'Université de Sherbrooke a ouvert une antenne à Moncton, au Nouveau-Brunswick, pour les francophones, pour former des médecins qui, formés sur place, restent sur place. La même chose à Ville-Saguenay. Voilà le type de solution dont nous sommes capables pour soutenir les régions rurales au Canada. Mais encore, faut-il avoir un gouvernement qui a la capacité de penser et de, de mettre de l'avant ces, ces solutions-là, au lieu de taxer les gens dans la, les régions rurales, ce que fait le gouvernement de M. Trudeau. Merci, M. Charest. Merci, messieurs. Euh, comme je l'ai indiqué en anglais, pour les deux prochaines questions, il y aura une section de discussion ouverte à la fin de la question et les réponses. Comme modérateur, je réserve le droit d'assurer que chacun des candidats a du temps équitable pendant la section de discussion ouverte. Et voici notre question. L'inflation est à son plus haut niveau depuis 40 ans. Les hausses de taux d'intérêt demeurent l'outil le plus puissant dont dispose la Banque du Canada pour lutter contre l'inflation persistante. Cependant, ces hausses ont un coût sur les hypothèques des gens et d'autres dépenses des ménages. Selon vous, quels sont les moyens à prendre pour rendre la vie des Canadiennes et Canadiens plus abordable? Pour cette question, on va commencer avec M. Scott Aitchison. Une minute, trente secondes. Merci, Rob. Premièrement, premièrement euh, il n'y a pas de solution miracle pour lutter contre l'inflation. Vous ne pouvez pas congédier un bureaucrate et le faire d'espèce. C'est un vrai défi et c'est la nécessité pour un vrai, une vraie solution et de la discipline fiscale. En tant que chef du Parti conservateur, ma priorité absolue sera de rendre la vie plus abordable 
pour vous, les Canadiens. Nous allons supprimer le taxe sur le carbone. Vous économiserez de l'argent sur le carburant et le chauffage. Les factures d'épicerie, son rôle de le contrôle et la gestion de l'offre, fait grimper et le coût des éléments comme le lait, les œufs et le poulet. Notre plan « Oui dans ma cœur » est une plan pour construire plus de maisons, rendre le logement à nouveau abordable. Le Canada connaît une crise du logement. Les prix ont doublé depuis l'élection de Justin Trudeau. Nous allons augmenter considérablement l'offre de logement au Canada. Nous rétablirons l'équilibre budgétaire. Et une fois que nous l'aurons fait, nous commencerons à réduire vos impôts et rembourser les dettes, et de sorte que la vie sera plus abordable pour les Canadiens. Merci. Merci, M. Aitchison. On va passer la parole maintenant à M. Jean Charest. Une minute, trente secondes. C'est le sujet dont on se fait parler probablement le plus avec les militants du parti, toute la question de l'inflation, mais aussi de l'accès la, 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 à la propriété. Sur l'inflation, euh, Scott le dit très bien, il n'y a pas de solution miracle. Mais il faut réduire les dépenses de l'État parce que les dépenses de l'État, ça alimente l'inflation. Et ça, on le savait. En fait, la Banque du Canada aurait probablement dû commencer plus tôt à augmenter les taux d'intérêt. Ils auraient dû le faire à leur réunion du 26 janvier. Moi, c'est la position que j'avais prise avant même d'entrer dans la course au leadership. L'autre élément de, de politique, ce serait de réduire les impôts personnels. C'est ce que j'avais fait, moi, pendant la grande crise. Euh, financière, la grande récession de 2008-2009, avec succès, parce que ça permet d'augmenter le revenu disponible des gens. Euh, Scott a soulevé à quelques reprises la question de la gestion de l'offre. Je veux profiter de l'occasion pour dire ceci. Je suis en soutien à la gestion de l'offre. Et si vous êtes un militant du parti qui est touché directement par la gestion de l'offre, je suis, je pense, à peu près le seul candidat de cette course au leadership qui, de manière sans équivoque, soutient la gestion de l'offre. Surtout dans une période de rupture, justement, des chaînes d'approvisionnement, il me semble qu'il y a là une stabilité pour le secteur rural au Canada et pour les gens qui habitent les régions rurales. Et, et Scott, vous dites que vous l'aboliriez, vous, vous, vous voulez l'abolir, puis en même temps négocier avec les Américains. Ça ne fera pas une négociation très forte si vous l'abolissez avant pour Merci, négocier après. Merci, Charles. Il y aura une discussion ouverte où euh, vous pouvez euh, élaborer euh, là-dessus. Euh, on va passer la parole maintenant à M. Roman Baber. Une minute, trente secondes. Merci, Rob. Il est important de reconnaître la cause de cette inflation. Ce n'est pas seulement le demi-milliard de dollars que nous avons imprimés ou imprunté ces dernières années. Ce sont les confinements qui ont fermé notre économie. On a arrêté la chaîne d'approvisionnement mondial à plusieurs Represser et la réouverture de notre économie ne peut pas satisfaire la demande. La Milo a choisi que nous pouvons faire pour combattre l'inflation et de donner au marché une stabilisation. Je ne permettrai à plus jamais un arrêt de l'économie ou un confinement. Je vais rétablir la discipline au gouvernement. Je vais abolir la taxe sur le carbone dès le premier jour. Je vais aussi réduire les impôts sur les revenus. Nous devons faire tout possible pour rendre la vie plus abordable. Merci. Merci, M. Baber. On va commencer maintenant la discussion ouverte à ce sujet euh, pour quatre minutes. Et j'invite M. Aitchison de commencer. Merci. M. Chalet, <rire> si nous mettrons donc fin à la, gest à la gestion de l'offre, vous économiserez de l'argent à l'épicerie et créer de, de nouvelles possibilités pour les agricultures canadiennes. C'est une opportunité. Mais le premier issue maintenant est le logement. Si, nous, si vous n'avez pas les moyens de vous payer une maison aujourd'hui, vous ne pourrez peut-être jamais le faire, à moins de prendre des mesures urgentes. Ça, c'est pourquoi j'ai une plainte. Oui, dans ma cœur, pour construire plus de maisons pour Canadiens. Le droit de réplique, que M. Charest. Ben, Scott, vous avez pris une position très claire sur la gestion de l'offre. La mienne est également très claire. Moi, je vous invite à en parler aux agriculteurs de votre comté, de l'Ontario, du Québec, d'évaluer combien ça coûterait 
si vous deviez vous avancer sur ce chemin-là. Mais quand vous dites « je vais l'abolir » pour ensuite négocier avec les Américains, honnêtement, ça ne fera pas une négociation qui va porter beaucoup si vous l'abolissez puis vous négociez après. La gestion de l'offre, ça nous assure un approvisionnement qui est stable, à des prix qui sont stables, et ça assure surtout à ceux qui habitent les régions rurales du Canada un revenu qui, qui descend. Et là où ils ont justement changé le système, ça n'a pas été à l'avantage euh, des consommateurs. Cela étant dit, sur la question justement de l'accès à la propriété, il faut lier le financement fédéral au développement urbain, au développement de la construction. Une des choses qu'on doit faire aussi, c'est encourager les euh, immigrants qui ont des métiers dans la construction à venir ici pour les construire des maisons, parce qu'on n'a pas assez de monde pour les construire, même si on voulait qu'on avait l'argent pour les construire. Il faut encourager la densité, il faut lier les programmes fédéraux avec les provinces, à la collaboration des provinces et des municipalités, de telle sorte que nous puissions créer des incitatifs. Une des choses que je ferais, Rob, moi, c'est mettre en place un congé de gain en capital pour ceux qui vendent des logements à multiples, à la condition qu'ils réinvestissent dans des logements multiples. Ça, c'est le genre d'initiative qui nous permettrait justement de nous rattraper sur la question de la construction des logements. Merci, M. Charest. M. Baber, avez-vous d'autres interventions? Non, euh, droit de réplique, M. Aitchison. Non. Non? non. OK. Bon, on va passer euh, à notre dernière question, hélas, avec une période euh, de discussion ouverte. Plus de 5 millions de Canadiennes et Canadiens n'ont pas accès à un professionnel de la santé. En juillet, les premiers ministres des provinces et des territoires du Canada se sont unis ensemble pour demander au gouvernement fédéral d'investir davantage dans les soins de santé. Quel rôle le gouvernement fédéral peut-il jouer pour résoudre cette crise des soins de santé? Et on va commencer avec M. Jean Charest, 1 minute 30 secondes. Merci, Rob. C'est un sujet, c'est probablement une des grandes priorités pour tous les, les Canadiens. Notre système de soins de santé, honnêtement, là, il ne fonctionne pas. C'était vrai avant la COVID, c'est pire depuis la COVID. Et comme premier ministre, dans les 100 premiers jours de mon gouvernement, je convierais les premiers ministres à une rencontre fédérale provinciale avec le Conseil de fédération, une rencontre qui serait coprésidée en passant par les premiers ministres, de telle sorte parce qu'on vit dans un système fédéral et la santé serait le premier sujet sur l'ordre du jour. Il y aurait également la question du logement, il y aurait également la question de l'économie, des grands sujets que nous devons aborder ensemble si on veut en venir à bout. Sur la santé, moi, j'ouvrirais la loi canadienne sur la santé. Je permettrais aux provinces d'innover. Je permettrais au secteur privé de jouer un rôle, mais attention, surtout dans un système public. Je vais être très clair avec vous, là. Il ne s'agit pas de mettre la main dans vos poches, là, pour payer davantage, mais plutôt de permettre au secteur privé, par exemple, avec des cliniques qui font des opérations de genoux, de hanches, de pouvoir le faire efficacement à un prix qui est meilleur et de sortir des patients des hôpitaux de telle sorte qu'on puisse traiter les cas qui sont plus lourds. Il faut encourager des immigrants qui ont des talents dans ces secteurs-là, qui ont des, des formations à venir ici. Le gouvernement fédéral peut très bien créer une plateforme qui nous permet d'attirer des talents pour venir ici pour le système de soins de santé. Puis oui, il faut augmenter le financement avec les provinces. Et, et ce serait bon que le gouvernement fédéral se présente à une réunion fédérale-provinciale au lieu de bouder les provinces. Merci, M. Charest. Maintenant, on va inviter M. Roman Baber de répondre. Une minute, trente secondes. Merci. Uh, nous avons une crise de santé. Le sol et l'unité d'urgence forment partout autour du pays parce qu'il y a un manque de personnel. C'est une blessure auto-infligée par le gouvernement. Nous, nous avons tiré les travailleurs en bonne santé à cause de leur choix de ne pas se vacciner. Mais aussi, beaucoup ont démissionné, ont pris leur retraite ou déménagé. Chaque employé doit retourner au travail. En euh, outre, euh, nous devons reconnaître que le Canada euh, possède un système de soins euh, le plus inefficace du monde développé. Nous avons le plus moins de lits par habitant de l'OCDE. Avec une population âgée, il y aura un besoin d'expansion. Je veux investir euh, les dollars fédéraux pour construire des hôpitaux. C'est quelque chose que je dis, dis, uh, discuterai uh, avec la province. Merci. Merci, M. Barber. On va passer la parole à M. Scott Aitchison. Une minute, 30 secondes. Merci, Rob. Nous avons autant de confinements 
En partie parce que nous avons un, un système de santé fragile. Nous nous pensons bon parce que nous avons un meilleur système de santé que les Américains et nous croyons que cela signifie que nous avons le meilleur système, système du monde. C'est faux. Nous ne devons pas avoir peur de débats et nous devons examiner d'autres modèles dans le monde, comme le, le modèle hollandais, et apporter des réformes importantes à notre système de soins de santé. Ce système repose sur la promesse que le gouvernement fédéral paye 50% coûte des soins de santé. Nous, avons, nous ne l'avons jamais fait. Et aujourd'hui, nous ne payons que 20%. Il n'y a pas de réponse facile. Mais nous devons discuter et travailler, travailler avec des provinces pour améliorer, améliorer ce système de soins de santé. Nous pouvons travailler avec les provinces les provinces pour accroître la capacité hospitalière, réduire les temps d'attente de, de, et augmenter le nombre de lits d'hôpitaux. Nous devons trouver des moyens de dispenser moins pour la gestion de la santé et plus pour la prestation des soins de santé de première ligne. Merci, M. Aitchison. Maintenant, passons à la période de discussion ouverte euh, de quatre minutes pour commencer. C'est au tour de M. Jean Charest. Ben, pour notre système de soins de santé, c'est absolument urgent qu'on se mette à la tâche avec les provinces pour commencer à le, le remettre sur pied, en quelque sorte. L'enjeu que nous avons vécu pendant la COVID, c'est un enjeu de capacité. Pourquoi au Canada, les mesures étaient plus sévères qu'ailleurs dans le monde? C'est parce que nos hôpitaux n'avaient pas la capacité d'absorber les, euh, les nouveaux patients. Mais si on veut y arriver... Il faut travailler en étroite collaboration avec les provinces. C'est ce que j'avais fait dans le passé. Vous savez, la dernière grande entente sur la santé là, qui a été conclue avait le soutien de Stephen Harper, qui était à l'époque chef de l'opposition officielle, alors que nous avions une entente avec une augmentation de 6 du financement par année, incluant la reconnaissance du fédéralisme asymétrique, incluant aussi le respect des compétences des provinces. Moi, Rob, il y a une chose qui m'a fait peur dernièrement. Les premiers ministres se sont réunis, puis ils ont interpellé M. Trudeau, qui est absent, « missing in action », comme on dit, là, sur ce sujet-là. Ils lui ont demandé de réagir, puis de répondre à leurs demandes, et là, c'est « silence radio ». Mais son ministre de la Santé dit « oui, on va donner du financement, mais à certaines conditions ». Savez-vous, j'ai eu un moment de crainte et de peur. J'ai eu comme un frisson, je vais vous dire pourquoi. Je me suis dit « tiens, le gouvernement qui n'est pas capable de gérer un bureau de passeport, aimerait ça gérer les urgences au Canada ?» Honnêtement, là. Si c'est ça l'approche la, la, du gouvernement de M. Trudeau, il est urgent pour nous de changer de gouvernement, puis d'élire un chef, puis un, un gouvernement conservateur qui sait comment fonctionne le pays, puis qui est capable de nous livrer des vrais résultats. Merci, M. Charest. Droit de réplique à M. Baber. Merci. Euh, nous avons une diminution de main d'œuvre au Canada. Nous devons d'abord embaucher tous les Canadiens disponibles et capables. Ensuite, nous devons renforcer le système avec plus de travailleurs dans le secteur de santé et, et une note de plus sur le soin de santé. Nous ne devrions jamais refuser l'accès égal à soins de santé et raison de tas de sang au choix médical. J'ai modifié la loi canadienne sur la santé pour protéger le choix médical de chaque Canadien. Merci. Merci, M. Barber. M. Aitchison. Non, c'est bien. OK. Merci bien. Merci. Est-ce que je peux ajouter, oh oui. Rob, juste Absolument. un commentaire rapidement? Il y a un sujet, on a beaucoup parlé, puis tous les trois, on s'entend là-dessus, sur les pénuries de main dœuvre dans le secteur de la santé. Évidemment, le personnel est épuisé. Et il faut le dire, ce sont des héros. Il faut reconnaître le travail exceptionnel qu'ils ont fait. Une des choses où le gouvernement fédéral peut être utile, c'est, sur le plan de l'immigration, un plan spécifique pour recruter et créer une plateforme pour recruter des immigrants qui sont justement des gens spécialisés dans le secteur de la santé, médecins, infirmières, également le personnel de soutien, et de travailler pour la reconnaissance des qualifications, qui est une compétence provinciale. Mais dans notre système fédéral avec, à, à nous, si on est intelligent, si on a une approche créative, on pourrait très bien créer une plateforme commune pour la reconnaissance des qualifications et accélérer la venue au pays d'hommes et de femmes qui vont travailler dans notre système de soins de santé. Merci, M. Charest. Merci, Monsieur. Pour terminer le débat de ce soir, les candidats ont maintenant une dernière chance, une dernière occasion de s'adresser aux membres militants conservateurs 
dans la langue de la choix. As our debate tonight comes to an end, I'll now invite each of the three candidates participating in the language of their choice to give one last pitch to Conservative Party members. And I know there's lots of discussion in the party about uh, organizers and the Leadership Election Organizing Committee that uh, crack down on candidates and impose all sorts of uh, sanctions or penalties. But we do do nice things for leadership candidates as well. So uh, we, uh, we have some extra time and so we're going to provide an extra minute to each of the three candidates to make their final closing pitch to members. Quatre minutes uh, chacun, three minutes, four minutes each. Commençons avec Monsieur Scott Aitchison. Thanks, Rob. Canadians are so frustrated with this government. They are looking for a credible alternative. And the majority of Canadians are just fed up with Justin Trudeau. But we must earn their respect as Conservatives and be united if we are to form the next government. We're not going to win in places like the island of Montreal, the lower mainland of BC, Atlantic Canada, the GTA around Toronto, unless we are addressing the real concerns of Canadians who live in these areas and all Canadians, regardless of their religion or ethnicity, see themselves reflected in our Conservative Party. That's why I have led by offering real solutions to today's challenges. Mes critiques diront que mon français n'est pas assez bon. Et c'est vrai, mais je continuerai à travailler, et une expression québécoise, je mettrai les bouchées doubles, et je vous promets, d'ici la prochaine élection, je parlerai couramment l'anglais et le français. I am running to lead the Conservative Party, and whether or not I win this race, as a proud member of the, par of the party in Parliament, I will continue to serve in the House of Commons and stand up for the values that we fought for in this leadership campaign. Can the others say the same tonight? John, I asked you earlier, you've given a lot to this country, but you didn't answer the serious question about your leadership and your dedication to the party if you don't win. Our party, our team, must be committed, and we, our members must be focused on uniting our party and dedicated to its future, offering real solutions. Can you honestly say that if you do not win this race, that you will be here on September 11th helping Leslin Pierre and me unite our party. I will continue to be a part of the Conservative team, fighting in Ottawa to hold Justin Trudeau to account and always looking for ways to deliver results that makes the lives of Canadians better. That's what I've always done in public life. Canadians deserve so much better from their federal government. And frankly, Canadians deserve better from us. Justin Trudeau did not win the last election. We lost it because we didn't get our act together. We have to do it this time and we have to come together. This leadership campaign has been divisive and in sometimes cases embarrassing. We have to come together and we must unite as a team, as a caucus, as a movement and present a clear, principled, consistent conservative message to Canadians and speak to the issues that matter to Canadians in all parts of the country not just our rural base. We have to address issues that matter to Canadians where we have not won in the last several elections. And we can't do that if we're fighting amongst ourselves. I will lead our team by bringing it together and working with that team, we will build that principled, inclusive and positive conservative platform that will deliver results for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. I ask for your help to make this happen. When you cast your ballot, please vote Scott Aitchison number one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Aitchison. We turn now to Robin Babber, four minutes. Thank you, Rob. Um, um, I'm just, I'm gonna abandon the notes and, and speak from the heart like I typically do. I'm genuinely concerned about the erosion of democracy in our country and of course the erosion of opportunity. Uh, I came to Canada when I was 15 and we didn't have a cent to our name. Um, my dad sold ice cream on those Dixie bicycles, but I've always had a job and I've always had this remarkable joy because I had Canadian opportunity. This country has given me every opportunity to work, to, to go to school, to join a, a big firm and then uh, go on my own and, and join a small firm and grow a small business. It's a remarkable blessing. I've always felt that this is the best country in the world because all you needed to do to succeed in Canada is just work hard and be nice to people, that's it. And if you just did those two things, then everything will be okay. 
And we get to do that and we get to keep our religious values and cultural values, we get to be ourselves. Um, this, is, uh, this country is such a blessing. And I'm not prepared to let it go. And I'm genuinely worried when I see 15% of Canadians still being treated like second-class citizens, when we see censorship on social media and on the news media, when we see our freedom of speech erode. For what? We know what the line is. Do not, God forbid, incite violence. Do not demonize an identifiable group of people like the Prime Minister does. But short of that, we have the right to be wrong. And whatever happened to, I might disagree with you, but I'll still defend your right to say it. We must preserve our freedom of speech because the freedom of speech is the holy grail of all rights. Because through speech we defend all of other rights and other Canadians. This is a legacy that we must cherish, our ability to disagree with each other respectfully. I also want to give you a little bit of, of strategy. A lot of folks ask me, Roman, we can't wait three years anymore. What are we going to do with, with this coalition government? And I say, well, first of all, I don't think we're going to have to wait that long. And if the rumors of a fall election are true, I say, bring it on. We can't afford another day of Justin Trudeau. But the key to all of this is Jagmeet Singh. Jagmeet Singh is the weak link. And I hold and I invite each of you to hold uh, Jagmeet Singh responsible for everything that this Justin Trudeau government does. He knows he's in trouble. He abandoned labor. He knows that he didn't stand up for their jobs. He knows that his organizers on the ground, the union bosses, they did not stand up for labor. And now is an opportunity for us because we are going to stand up for Canadian workers. And finally, I ask that you rank me first because we have to get out of this mess. We have to end this nightmare that we've been living for two and a half years. There's nothing else to do. Most of us had COVID. 85% of us are vaccinated. Canadians are suffering from a mental health post-trauma and they're not going to begin to heal until we move past this public health exercise and just allow ourselves to make our own choices. And it's also very important that history regards everything that happened fairly. That the tactics that were used against Canadians for the first time, like segregation and psychological manipulation and censorship, that they're not viewed justifiable in the future. Because if somehow history regards them fairly, then we will never get our democracy back and we will never fully go back to normal. And I find those two propositions unacceptable. We're getting our democracy back and we're going back to normal. Full stop. That's why I'm here. And that's why I ask that you rank me first. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Baber. We'll now move to uh, Jean Charest. The final word, uh, four minutes, sir. Thank you very much. Et Rob, je fais mes remarques à la fois en anglais et en français. But let me start by saying something that is pretty fundamental to political life. Leadership is about showing up. Showing up in all circumstances. It's about being accountable to the members of the party, you, the ones who decide who the next leader will be and answering questions and debating with other candidates. All my life, I've showed up. We were badly defeated in 1993 as the Progressive Conservatives. There was two members left. I was the only one re-elected. I didn't walk away. I showed up. I stayed to rebuild the party. To great sacrifice for which I'm eternally indebted to my wife, Michelle, and the family. But I did it out of conviction. In 95, there was a referendum. I showed up. In 98, there was a call to go fight another referendum in Quebec. I showed up. In 97, we had a federal campaign. We went from two to 20 members. I showed up. I showed up at every moment when it was important for the country, when it was important for my party, when it was important for the future of Canada. Leadership is about fighting and showing up. It isn't about running away. In this leadership race, I've met with thousands of conservatives across the country. By the way, of all stripes and colors, and we're not hyphenated conservatives, that's not what we want for the future, but there are conservatives in this party who believe in families, who believe in issues that are faith-based, for example. All of you have a place at the table. I want you to know that. A political party is a living institution. We have shared values, 
fiscal conservatism, market-based economy, economic policies that promote economic growth. We believe in families, plural. We also believe, by the way, in law and order, which is fundamental to the freedoms in our society. And none of us have the luxury, by the way, especially if you're a legislator, to go out there and encourage people to break laws. And that doesn't mean that we hinder free speech, quite to the contrary. Believe me, I've been around long enough and on both sides to know that every single citizen in this country has a right to speak out. And none of us should have been subjugated to what the Trudeau government imposed with the War Measures Act, which, which became the Emergencies Act. It was quite unbelievable. And Roman, I know you feel strongly about that. You paid a price for it. And that I find to be very admirable. Showing up also means, in the end, uniting this party. There are millions of Canadians who want us as Conservatives to be that national alternative. Now, let me add this. A lot of Canadians are also tired, they're frustrated, some of them are angry. But anger is not a political program. The challenge of real sh leaders who show up is to take that and to translate that into something positive for the future of the country, to a program, to uniting the party, to unite the country, to make it work, because we know we can do better. Nous pouvons, nous les conservateurs, être justement cet instrument d'unité. Nous l'avons fait dans le passé, et je le ferai à l'avenir. Pour répondre à la question de Scott, to answer Scott's question, I have all my life been a conservative, and I believe in conservative values. I led a coalition government in Quebec because, as a conservative, I believed in the unity of this country. I'm not going to change, but I'm going to be the leader of this party. You have a vote, you have a voice, and you have a choice as a member of this party. And I am asking you to support me so that we can do the job we need to do to unite the party and unite the country. Thank you, Mr. Chara. I want to thank uh, all of our candidates who are participating tonight, Roman Baber, Scott Aitchison, Jean Chara, for being here. On behalf of the Leadership Election Organizing Committee, including the debate committee of Rick Eckstein, Dion Carey, and Eleanor Miller, I hope tonight's debate has given Conservative Party members who haven't voted more to think about. As of last night, we have received approximately 150,000 ballots. This means that the vast majority of Conservative Party members have yet to vote. To be counted, your ballot needs to be received in Ottawa by September 6th. If you have questions, please go to the party's website, www dot conservative dot ca www point conservateur point ca the results will be announced on september 10th at the shaw center in ottawa please join us either in person at the shaw center in ottawa on september 10th or watch the results at home online or on your preferred source of news please vote we have set record numbers 678,000 plus Conservatives, eligible vote, never seen before in Canadian history. Be part of the change. Be part of history to change Canada for the better. No matter how long you have been a member of the Conservative Party, no matter why you joined, no matter who you support in this leadership race, you have a home in this party. Vous êtes chez vous au Parti Conservateur du Canada. Cette coalition est plus forte avec l'implication de tous. A new Conservative leader, and ultimately our next Prime Minister, is just a vote away. Good night, a bonne soirée.